<laughs> Are we ready, guys? Okay. I memorized this, but I'm so nervous I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> uh, my name is Sonia Sato, and welcome to my studio, and welcome to the Gutter Blood Podcast. juice up here and uh, we, got, we got to get going, but you all know who you are and a lot of you in the room. Um, I am going to shout out the core. We have Rita Marie Roth over here, my rigger. She's been with me from the beginning when I first started showing artists up here, which then evolved into the pop show and put this up in this room with hers right next to her. She loans it to me and she's a sculptor and that really comes in handy. Um, and then, of course, my AV team and my volunteer AV team that has made this amazing and at a level that kind of blows my mind, and that is uh, Christos Tatiakis over here. <laughs> and in back, we got Dionisio Caruso, and we have Ethan Kimbler. <laughs> okay, and then our host tonight, Laura Werman, who's also been with me from the very beginning. She's been to every show. And, uh, brought her in because we love her, and of course our, our guest, Annette Carlazzi, Lauren Wyatt Ford, who is here from Spain, she got in the last and she still, uh, you know, she still wanted to be with us, so it's a huge honor, huge, huge honor, and Emily Lee, who we all adore. Uh, I also want to thank past, uh, past hosts, um, they're all in the room, Kevin and um, Ivester, right over here. They were the first to agree to talk show. They were my first guests, and they uh, continue to show up and be by my side by this day. And then, of course, uh, past guests, many of whom are with us tonight uh, in this room. Um, for those of you who are watching and all the rest of you, uh, you can check out the cornucopia of people, past shows, and help support us on our YouTube channel. And for, the, uh, for those of you who are tuning in, thank you. And subscribing will make a difference. We want subscribers. And uh, I'm so happy you're all here. Nice. Uh, Yay. Yeah. So nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Some of you I know, some of you I don't. Um, I'm not good in front of camera, so I'm a little nervous. Okay, but um, I'm going to kind of run things differently rather than going into the bona fides of each person. This is community. This is a conversation our community has needed to have for a long time. And so we're going to talk to each one of these very opinionated, and I mean that in the most respectful way, uh, about what they think art's writing is. And then we're going to open it up, because I'm sure I can see the little fingers itching to go in the air to ask questions, because I know I'd have them. But um, art's writing, what is it? I think it's a bigger conversation than what we will have just here, but I think to start it off as to what we think it is, you know, it's not just a takedown, oh, someone did this crummy thing, whatever. It's art writing encompasses a lot of things, monographs and, you know, reviews and books. You know, each one of these ladies here has done all of the above. So let's start it, if you don't mind, why don't you start it out? I'd love to, what do you think of art writing? Like when, when someone says, oh, art's writing, what comes to mind for you? Well, um, I'll speak from my own experience. Yes. That's think, all that's I can all, do. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, and for me, uh, what I'm interested in doing is kind of being a liaison between 
the artist and the work of art and the viewers that can encounter them. And that's in between position is where I put myself. Um, so in a way, I'm an advocate um, because I've been a curator, mostly in kind of museum kinds of spaces for most of my career. Um, it's not so much about a critical statement, because as I think back on it, I realize that the critique is kind of inherent in the place where you are. It's like somebody's already said, often me has already said, this is valuable, this is worth your time, come look at this. Um, so it's not so much about the critique, but usually it's about how do you express clearly the facts about the work so that everybody starts out kind of in the same place. How do you put focus maybe or open up a space to some key ideas about the work and then you step back. And I'm talking here both about, for instance, the text that you see in museum or gallery spaces and what you say out loud. Um, for me, it's evolved over the years, and this is not going to be horribly long, I'll wrap it up, um, in that at some point in time, I became aware of something that a scholar told me was called ekphrastic writing, which turns out there's hundreds and hundreds of years of tradition on, starting with the Greeks, at least in that culture anyway. Um, and that's writing in response to works of art. So not writing for the audience to really understand, to offer a kind of educational opening, but in fact, a creative response to the work of art with words. And so that's something that I've been working at. It's, it's a personal creative response. I've been able to do it in public spaces. I've been able to do it in collaboration with artists, um, Steve Wyman, um, Annette Lawrence, uh, recently uh, Francesca Fuchs from Houston in a test site show that I did um, last year. Um, so there, that's a different way of writing about art. And, and my interest is in, so I got my way at the table by virtue of being able to be a curator. But my interest is how can we get as many people around that table as possible? And how can we get as many vocabularies as possible loaded into the conversation. So right now, for me, art writing is more of a personal project. Um, and that's OK, because I did the other stuff for decades. And I still can do it when called upon. But there's a, a lovely kind of personal place where the visual, the somatic, and the verbal can come together to help me look more deeply and to really move me uh, intellectually and spiritually kind of beyond all those realms. And so those are three different ways that you can write about art to totally different purposes. But I think they have to be part of a conversation. And at least that's the part I can well, add. Could, full disclosure, each one of our guests up here, we had long conversations. They came by or we had a zoom or facetime call and advocacy that was each each one of you has a, a statement that stood out to me when i took away and advocacy was mm -hmm. kind of the the takeaway for me you mm -hmm. know so do, would you consider that a accurate absolutely okay yeah, i love that yeah, yeah, okay yeah. yeah because because works of art the experiences we have with works of art are limited to the time and the place where we're all together with them. Mm. What lives on is the published word oftentimes, to the point where I as a curator, working over a long period of time, many artists I'm sure in this room, we've all had experiences where we've done our very best work. There's been something magical that happened and nothing exists of it anymore because there was not a budget for a catalog, there's no written record, yada, yada, yada. So when there is a word, when there is publishing of some sort, it lives, it exists. We all need that to help further our opportunities. Opportunities. Ephemeral action, you know. Right, is, which is fine. Which I kind is of fine, but. made my peace with that. It's like, okay, all that makes up who you become as a human being. That's probably the most important thing. But the second most important thing is 
there's a trace that allows whoever put forward the most work to feel like it exists in the world. Yeah. Okay. Well, Emily, how about you? Um, I know my takeaway, I'm gonna let you take over, but I have my takeaway from your yours and my conversation. You know, we had a long, I think you were at my house for three juicy. and a half hours. It was <laughs> juicy. Yeah. I got I got notes. Yeah. yeah. But why don't you go ahead and yeah. Yeah. Um, well, something that resonated with me that I'll echo from Annette's point is, uh, yeah, an interest in, in somatic experience, which is um, the experience that you have of something as a person with a body and what your body is going through as you experience something. Um, so I just, like, I know that art writing can take a lot of different forms, and I, we could probably all, like, popcorn uh, what these different forms are, whether they're art criticism in glass tire or art forum or it's like John Berger kind of cr cultural criticism or any number of things books monographs whatever um, but also there's so many other places that text lives with art that I would love to kind of call attention to because it's interesting how often we see a work of art that is not just on its own it's actually being buttressed or supported whether obviously or covertly by text, um, whether that's like an exhibition text or wall text or even just a label next to a piece of art. And I think like that, I'm really at attentive to that uh, relationship between just a form without language, maybe a painting, maybe a sculpture, whatever, a performance, and then the, the kind of human desire or necessity to expand that experience in text. And for me, like, I make art, so I think that's why I'm kind of always, I have this kind of love-hate relationship with translating an art experience into text. But uh, I, I'm interested in the way that like text can slow down time or speed up time. So in a wall text, like when you walk into a museum and you see uh, wall text, it's a pretty good candidate to be a, a moment where text speeds up time, but that's not always the case. But sometimes if a show is explained to you in wall text first, it, it speeds up your experience, your somatic experience of walking through the gallery. It says what you're going to see. It says what the show's about. And other kinds of text, maybe they don't do much explaining. Maybe they slow down time and they help, maybe a review or something helps describe each little particular detail of a show and actually the show like you said is expanded beyond its lifespan and it gets to live on in this weird kind of particulate way and I yeah so I, I write usually the form I tend to write in is exhibition texts and um, reviews but uh, that's just kind of what they have to get called oftentimes I just I like to write from a first-hand experience of encountering a work and using language as, although it's a precise tool, using it as an imprecise tool or like a creative medium. Um. Well, what we talked about was you consider your arts writing a part of your actual creative practice too, which is, which is so interesting, you know, as an actively working artist and adding the writing, I think that that, I don't know, there's, I find that an interesting take on how that so yeah, yeah. do you want to yeah that's a good I think Lauren probably does this too because you make work as well but um but yeah I think I'm I find that the most useful thing for my practice to do for me is to uh engage with my subconscious and try to uh be improvisational in the moment in the studio and then once a thing is made to go back and maybe read it or come to come to see what all came out of that moment in the studio and because there's so many other places in life where I'm using my logical brain to have a studio space where you can just engage with your subconscious feels extremely valuable and so having a concurrent writing practice where my logical brain can just do the thing where it needs to describe everything having a concurrent practice that kind of alleviates my studio practice of having to be super logical. Mm -hmm. So 
as a human, I think I'm probably always going to need to describe stuff. I'll do that in text, and it kind of helps my studio practice be a place where I don't have to say my work is about anything. I can just work and understand it later. I love that. Well, you and I had a lovely discussion over computer, and I think uh, accessibility of voice was one of the things that, and um, I'll let you know. You tell me what voice, like the voice that defines how you write from. So yeah, take it away. Yeah, I was recently told that um, my writing is direct and clear and accessible to anybody, and that in some ways is the highest compliment because I think that art has a problem. For me, the purpose of art is communication, and so is writing, but it often, coming from a background like I do, which isn't very academic or cultural, I know that art can often have a problem connecting with people outside of its kind of small sphere. And so I view my job as a writer, my goal is to communicate, to help inform, engage, explain, ideally illuminate something about the artist's background. Because the question I'm trying to get at when I write ultimately and do interviews is why do you do this? Why do you do what you do? And I think that's also the question I ask myself as a practicing artist. And so. I sort of think of my art practice and my writing as counterpoints because my art practice is very personal and it's expressive. It is about my memories and my subjectivity, but my writing, I sort of fade to the background and my voice isn't as important as conveying a message and communicating, hopefully to as many people as possible. And so I try to avoid jargon or language that might be alienating to people that aren't part of this kind of group or an art sphere. And the other motive I have is that I'm, because I'm also an artist, I know a lot of artists and I feel like my writing is a way to be an advocate for artists. Um, I really love writing about places like Texas or the part of Spain that I now live in because there's still sort of peripheral places where they don't get as much attention and something like documenting someone's project in writing, giving it another life. and is a way to provide a platform and hopefully widen an audience to that person. And so for me, I do it because of a commitment to other artists that I admire and want to learn more about. I love that. Advocacy, I mean, that seems to be kind of the, the running theme and stuff. So um, I'm going to open up the floor if anybody has anybody itching to, um, we can keep going, but does anyone have a thought, a conversation they want to start about, yeah. Well, I had a thought in relation to Epitaph, and then you had the, everybody talk about the rational, the descriptive, and all those different things, and how the ekphrastic writing uh, is the one that kind of, it takes, it, it's kind of risky for the writer, <laughs> And um, it's sort of, you, you're not really telling the person what to feel, but um, I think it's a great angle to help people overcome their inhibitions to let go in front of artwork and enter into their own absurd experience of it. Um, and then they can also gather up the other information. And, I, you know, so I, th I think that's an important pillar that's often forgotten, though, that kind of uh, experience uh, that would open things for people as much as telling us about, oh, and their father came from here, and she did this, and then she did that, and she suffered here. But then you become involved with all that. But this other idea is you really just say, uh, first, I can experience it. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's really rich and um, takes the reader off guard. Also, they have to be in the moment to yeah. be with the work in yeah. the moment as opposed to reading yeah. the wall text. They have yeah. to be like, what am I looking at? Am I sickened? Am I scared? Am I happy? Whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And it's more egalitarian, yeah. which yeah. I think is a goal that all of us share. Very much. It's more, you know, if, if a person um, 
is designated an authority, nothing shuts things down faster than that. You've got a single point perspective, that's all you've got, right? So in a situation where people are invited to respond with their own language, with their own riffs, with their own images described in words to some work of art, to a performance, with time-based, whatever it is, suddenly you have a room full of collaborators. Um, I would hazard a guess that almost any maker of an object or a performance would be delighted to hear what anybody else had to say about it. It's, it's just more egalitarian. Uh, that's what I have to come back to all the time. And, and in that sense, although it's this ancient thing, it feels very much of the moment right now as well, um, especially because social media has opened up the notion of criticism um, and taken it from an ivory tower of some sort into a broader dialogue where everyone's an expert because everybody can post and everybody can say and everybody can learn from interacting with those things. So it, it feels very much of the moment, I think. One thing that wasn't mentioned though, anything anybody mentioned the critique idea. Like right. that's the most m nasty, uncomfortable, you know, and, and is it necessary? Is it is it, isn't that an important part of developing the level in a community um, a little bit? And not to say something is bad, but to, you know. What, what does that look like to you? Like when you read art reviews, are you, I mean, I know, you know, there's that, pe that petty side of us all where we read that takedown and we're like, oh my God, that was so. But what, like in a real sense, what do you, what do you look for in a review that you take away and go, damn, I'm going to go see that show, or I'm going to contact that artist and just give them a thumbs up. Like, what do you see in a review that makes you, <laughs> you're in the chair by here oh, for I'll, a reason. I'll, I'll um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think when I read the reviews, I, I, want, I do want to hear the experience of looking at the work, if I can't get to the work especially. And... Um, the critique part is, I, I don't know, it's a, a qual developing a, a, an ability to evaluate things. It's not a, here's the line, this, this is crossed, it's bad. It's more like teaching people to um, have a, a sense of weight or value. I mean, just doing this. Mm -hmm. like, and yes, compared to what? Or if we step outside Austin, or if we you know, how does this fit into the larger way of trends or talking or, um, you know, is, is this, a, let's say, a form of uh, abstraction that it's like they, the, the painter didn't even know that it was just, it's already been in circulation for so long and they're kind of rehashing it and maybe they need lack of originality. Or, I, you know, you can go at it as, as a, not a critique, a put down, but to help, almost help the artists to kind of think, well, okay, in addition to the world, the general public that's listening, there are people listening to my work for the edges that you strive for, that maybe is only audible to people who have, are really intent on looking. So I think you have to hit both places. Um, I don't know, what do you all think about having to evaluate people's work or say something evaluative. That's well, historical press. I'm such a big fan of where things fall in a historical precedent, not for good, bad, whatever, but for what has come before. So like you say, you're not just doing the same abstraction that has been done to death 50 years before. Like, why are you exploring abstraction now and stuff? So that's the kind of thing. So yeah. but. I want to hear, this is going to sound like I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but I'm thinking of it differently. Um, I want to hear perspectives other than my own. So I love when makers write about art because oftentimes there'll be a slightly different kind of language or vocabulary than I would have come up with in my own personal lyrical kind of way. Um, I love Emily and Lauren's work. I love Hill Snyder, who writes in Glass Tire. You know, 
Hills can talk about anything, write about anything. I'm going to just put aside the time and read it. I love writers who engage with the history of ideas and place the work in that conversation. Um, in his good days, Dave Hickey, uh, Holland Cotter in the New York Times, Robert Ferris, who's in the room, people who can put the work in dialogue with something else that I may not know about because I don't have a PhD in English. You know, oh, now I understand that edge that I didn't quite know before, you know. So that's my answer to that. But what would you all say? Well, what you said earlier resonates with me is that by choosing a subject, you're already making a judgment call. Because writing takes a lot of time and energy and effort and thought. And so I typically don't write about things that I, from seeing the show, don't find interesting or find unsuccessful. Because if I'm going to spend hours and hours with it and I have only negative things to say, it doesn't, it's not the way that I would work. And in fact, I don't call myself an art critic, I call myself an art writer, partly for that reason. I also don't choose to write about someone like Jeff Koons because there's plenty of ink spilled about someone like that and so there's nothing that I can really bring by writing about them or documenting their efforts so yeah. for me it's already a judgment call. That said there are obviously artists and exhibitions that I've written about that are maybe a mixture of both where there are merits that I want to talk about and celebrate and explore and then there are points that need to be sort of highlighted as negative or neglectful or unsuccessful and I do do that but overall um, I think for me the purpose of writing about art is to focus on people and things that deserve more attention that's my philosophy yeah I think um, for me um, I was actually just talking about this the other day with my friend who's also an artist, but um, when you're in the studio making very tiny, seemingly pretty ir irrelevant decisions, like, do I make this really smooth or really rough? Or like, do I paint it blue? I don't know. You're like, you're actually assigning value. You're, you're assigning value to these really kind of whatever decisions all the time. So I think I think as an artist, for me at least, from my experience, it, it does give me a, kind of an inflated sense of opinion on things that maybe don't matter that much. Um, which means that like everything kind of comes to represent a principle or a value system. So the choice to paint a piece of steel becomes a bigger conversation about uh, being making a decision uh, in favor of a facade or putting putting a, a facade onto a, a material or not you know it and that that's like a more that's a weightier decision than just should this thing be blue or not blue and so there's all of these kind of principles that get baked into these everyday decisions that we make and I make and um, and so when I see I think that it's it's okay to admit that when as an artist when you see a show that that doesn't feel uh, cognizant of the weight of these aesthetic decisions, you do have the, I have the impulse to uh, make note of that in language. So if there's a show that claims, that has chosen to, through language, claim to be about ecology and all of the work is made out of foam <laughs> and on a CNC router, I, you know, I, if I wasn't making stuff, I maybe wouldn't feel this way, but I do think that there's actual like consequence to those choices. And if we're in this era of trying to think outside binaries, I think calling attention to that wouldn't be to say it's bad or it's good. It would just be to kind of enrich the experience of, and to maybe also extend the time the, to, to slow down the looking of looking at this really beautiful CNC routed foam orchid for example. Um, that is a totally hypothetical work, I promise. It's not, I know, I know. I'm like, I'm like patchworking a bunch of things, but um, not a call out. But yeah, I, I think it's also kind of, as Lauren was saying too, like, and I think literary criticism works like this as well, but it's, it's kind of an honor for someone to spend time on your show, whether it is 
uh, on the surface considered a takedown or considered like a really positive review. Someone has, your art has affected someone enough that they need to translate that weird sensation into language for them to understand it or to share it or communicate it. And that is, the fact that your art can do that is really cool. And um, it's an honor for someone to write about it, even if it's writing that says like, this thing made me feel horrible. Um, or like, I don't really, I don't really get how these things line up in the show. Um, or, you know, I, I would have loved this show if everything was like three inches higher. There's like, yeah, it's, it, it means that someone was really um, well, affected. Well, there's an inherent respect to it. It's like, yeah, you I give it the time of day. And I wanted it to be this because it, because I can see that your, you know, in my opinion, your vision would have been more concise because of, you know, mm -hmm. not yeah. made with CNC foam. Yeah, yeah. and that <laughs> conversation too that y'all yeah. that were having about um, about the subjectivity, like that's part of why that feels super important is because you're not actually making a value judgment on if something is good or bad. Even if you say, that's bad, you're actually saying, I think that's bad, and who am I? You know, I'm a very, very specific person with very specific needs, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not the authority on if this thing is good or bad. Well, you talked about we we had this conversation too, and you talked about you write in absolutely first person, and you describe in pretty explicit detail, like I love the just the vision of you walking in the room with your coffee and that kind of thing. It's like it brings you to those of us reading it, a show we may have missed or a show we're like, oh, maybe I'll give that another. Like there's just bringing your vision into it. You're not making a value judgment. You're relating your experience. I think that's in, that to me, this is all about this advocacy kind of, you know, it's just this is what I know. Take it or leave it. But y'all need to know about it. That's the, that's the. It's changed incredibly over generations because there's there's actually you know sort of moral issues embedded in the idea of writing in the first person and who's the person doing the writing and why do they have the authority to do that I mean that floats throughout this conversation um, and we've come so far thank God in the in the affording of um, intelligence to anybody who chooses to make an informed statement about something because you know the world of critics back when the art world in this country at least was kind of coalescing in the 50s and the 60s you know the world was like that big there were just a few voices and even now who brought up the issue to me already that oh, it was you actually that Roberta Smith is retiring from the New York yeah. Times and it's like whoa that's an event because she was, for so many years, a singular voice. And um, I think it's great that we're at a place now, it took me a long time to just give myself permission to write in the first person, because at first it seemed I was not worthy, and then it seemed like, God damn it, I'm gonna put my voice out there. And now it's sort of normal and natural, but there's a whole arc of history embedded in having arrived at this place that I think is pretty meaningful, especially given the exclusivities and power relationships that are just built into this art world and this art ecosystem that we're all part of. I think the active word in, the, in that statement is informed, because that's mm -hmm. the thing. Like I, I want somebody saying something about work that knows what they're talking about that has that is that has the intention of adding to the conversation in a helpful way you know whether it is like mm, maybe that wasn't as successful or mm, that was really successful but adding to the conversation in a helpful way as opposed to just like Ugh, my kid you know as we've all my kindergarten child could do that. It's like, come on, that's just so stupid. Stop saying that. That we've just, you know, we've dispelled that. But I think it is. It's that informed voice is somebody, you know, that that comes in and that, you know, 
you coming in from a place of a maker, the both of you, it's like you're coming in as somebody who is in the studio with a process and you bring that into an, a show and go, oh, okay, let's, let's see, how did they get here? And you can, you know, almost reverse engineer to, you know, and write the review from that place. And stuff. So, so what kind of forum do we need here now? I mean, I think everybody mourns the loss of sight lines, which gave voice to lots of different people in a forum that was easily uh, available. A question too. Or a comment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good. I'm Come on. Ask what you think the outlook for arts writers. Do you think it's, it'll be relegated as a practice for love or part time? Because many of the publications yeah. that supported arts writing are either diminished or gone. Mm -hmm. The nonprofits mm -hmm. are strapped. Social media doesn't pay. Where, where, I mean, where, where do we come out? Where does it go? <coughs> well, we, we, you, we talk nuts and bolts a lot, you know, yeah, with, with stuff. Question. So yeah. yeah, you have, you had some thoughts on this. So yeah. Okay. Well, to be perfectly honest, in my experience, art writing is not super sustainable, unfortunately. Um, which feels like an odd parallel to an art practice, which is often not financially uh, lucrative either. And so you often feel like you're laboring out of love and passion and interest and all these things. And then the uh, compensation doesn't necessarily feel reflective of that. Um, I guess it also depends on the way that a person writes. Um, I know for me personally, when I write, I tend to invest a lot of time. If I go I'm going to write about a show, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to maybe do a curator tour. I'm going to read the whole catalog. I'm going to do my own research. I'm going to try to know as much as I can because it feels irresponsible for me to speak about someone or something without really deep diving myself into that person, their context, um, their history. Um, and with that in mind, it doesn't feel very sustainable. Um, that said, I only have my own experience. Um, and I do think what Annette was saying is, while social media doesn't pay, it is wonderful, this idea of a proliferation of voices and the accessibility that comes with it. Um, I think it's a tricky subject for me, though. I don't want to be um, only a negative voice. I think there are publications that do a good job of working with their writers. Um, Glass Tire, for example, I've worked with them for a long time because they are very sustainable. Um, they've been wonderful to work with in terms of editing. Well, that, I mean, that, you can't pay rent on that. That's right. So do you think that there's, if you jump way into the future, because social media does create an audience and there's a voice to be had and there's a conversation and there's a hook, you know, there's, there's there's more activity there than anywhere else. Do you think something will come out the other end of that that financially supports arts writing somehow? I think what's tricky. otherwise, arts writing, the good people won't do it. I think it's tricky because I think that the speed at which our attentions have drastically <laughs> reduced it has a lot to do with social media and it has carried over to publications because wow. they I think I don't know a lot about the editorial side but I do feel like you know traffic is important for them and I really can't speak to that the logistics of that but um, I do think that that can be a bit of a detriment to someone that wants to write thoughtful careful uh, reviews and things because if it's not inflammatory and explosive and you know, bombastic, that might be less exciting for something like a, a tweet post or a, some kind of well, post. But there's a lot of long form that's happening on Medium or um, sub, uh, well, sub, 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 sub Yes, thank you. And so there's, there's forms, and those are subscription and uh, any other thoughts? I mean, I, are not some... Some substats you some, do, yeah. Some, some, some are subscriptions, that's yeah. how they fund them. I mean, this is from the other side as an artist. Getting a, getting a review or getting someone to write about your work is becoming increasingly rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because you know four people and you've got to call the four people and if they can't do it who's going to do it right well this is right. another topic that yeah. that Lauren and I you know we decided that this could be like an entire talk on itself is the ways to get you know like having the bullet point discussion about how to get your as an artist get somebody to write about your work and stuff and you had thoughts which yeah we talked about that and stuff which I mean you don't I'm not gonna put you on the spot here but <laughs> yeah everyone turns and is like yeah no I won't put you on the spot but I mean I think that's such a, a bigger that's a much bigger topic it's sort of I, I looked at this as a way to sort of start the conversation about what we think art writing is and then whoo we could have another two-hour night about <laughs> how to get it done but I, I would only say from from my perspective 50 odd years of doing this that that this is always going to be a labor of love that as long as production in our universe is tied to revenue th that there will not be I would love to see it I don't want to say there will not be because I don't want to sound pessimistic but but I have not yet seen any structural system that can support financially support the work of the makers the writers the performers at the level that that work requires um, you know the institutions that came up around, whether they were artist spaces, alternative spaces, or even mainstream galleries and museums, have their own superstructure that has to be supported as well. And so things still are just crumbs that filter down. I, I've not seen any structural system, however, I've lived my whole life in a capitalist country and haven't had enough exposure outside of that to say, oh, well, this is how it could be done. I mean, obviously, government's not going to do it. So I, I just want to find ways. I would love to find ways where we, who are part of an essentially nonprofit world, can <laughs> sustain one another in the doing of it. And as the mother of a wrestler, um, <laughs> I just think everybody has to have a day job, you know? <laughs> I mean, and, and it's a question of how you, <laughs> you know, that's what it comes down to, uh, you know, how you are able to reconcile the pursuit of the talent, the passion, the inspiration, the true source of life against how you pay the rent. Um, you know, in literature, I read about such worlds, but I, but I personally haven't experienced it yet. And if somebody knows a way to jumpstart that here in Austin, I want to be part of it. But I, I, you know, I think we need to kind of accept certain things, you know. I don't know. Is that horrible? What's that? Is it Jamie? Oh, yeah. Oh, Hi, Hi Jamie. to largely ephemeral works and help things live on longer. So I guess my questions are, let's like bring in more local. Um, what do you love about writing about art in Austin? Lauren, I know you write about art elsewhere, staying in other places. Um, what do you like about writing about things here? What do you wish we had that we don't? And then kind of part two, you know, if writing about art is a labor of love, how do we find more venues for that kind of writing here? Like, of course, it, you, know, if we, you know, if we don't have a huge bankroll to start a new arts criticism magazine tomorrow, what are other, like, how, how else can we get more writing about our local art community? So what do you love about writing about Austin? What do you wish we had more of? And, and what do you think about, like, more venues where this kind of critical, serious writing could, could be read? Who wants to take? I really like, um, I guess the answer to why I like writing about work in Austin is maybe the same answer as like why I like making work in Austin or in Texas um, or just the South is uh, is that I there's a lot of um, it's a really weird place and it has been for a really long time. Um, I'm from the Gulf Coast of Texas, so like pretty much Louisiana and the swamp. Um, and I'm also, yeah, I, my family wasn't, my family immigrated there. And so there's all of, there's a lot of 
overlapping cultural uh, think like in incongruities that that kind of happen in Texas and also I grew up in Texas and so I I feel like I had to take like four Texas history classes <laughs> over the course of my youth and all of them said the same thing and it wasn't until I was like 25 that I realized that the verbal history of Texas is very much not what happened and that uh, what I was taught in Texas history uh, they were kind of like paranoidly telling me what the story of Texas was because they really didn't want me to know what the story of Texas actually was um, which was that it was uh, brutally taken from Native American tribes for a really really long time and, and the Comanches held out till like the 80s um, you know so there's been a lot of overwriting, a lot of language applied to the landscape that over time has actually worked. And now as a 20 something year old in Texas, I find myself having been uh, convinced of that story that was superimposed onto this place. And now, just now learning the ways in which that uh, was actually just language painted on and not actually part of this place. Um, so, working, you know, trying to put language on top of art. So there's like this raw experience, this firsthand experience of like me in this cup, me in the sculpture, whatever. That doesn't have language to it yet. It's when I try to understand it and try to describe it and write about it that it begins to accumulate a story. And I just think that it's kind of appropriate to be writing about, to be making art making things without language, and then also to be dealing with language in, a, in this kind of weird contentious state where language and material have always kind of been at odds. Um, and there's also just a lot of, uh, there's a lot of art that, like Marie Lorenz's show at Dusty Gallery is one that I wrote about, and she made this piece that basically she, she scavenged, there's a lot more to it, but she scavenged trash objects from the dam from the river next to um, the house gallery that the show was in. Um, and those objects became part of her sculpture. And uh, that was totally rich in itself. And I don't think that you really need to like uncover a mystery to a work of art in order for there to be, or like have a single point perspective of this person who holds all the knowledge. I don't think you need to uncover like a history to a thing to, ha to find meaning in just its form. but. It was interesting because I realized that, that the trash that she was um, scavenging for this show was part of this greater historical uh, thing where Tom Miller Dam on Holly Street, uh, Austin, the city of Austin built Tom Miller Dam to kind of increase tourism. And it was, it was the creation of that dam that actually increased tourism, increased pop, uh, pollution, and in the end, like Marie is like making a show on the street that butts up next to Tom Miller Dam, pulling from the pollution from that former dam. Um, so it, I think that there's sometimes uh, conversations that open up when you're in such a, a strange place with with complicated histories about um, its landscape. And I kind of think that any show, you could look at any show here and say like, how does this relate to the site? whether the site is the gallery or the street or the neighborhood, and it becomes richer because of that. I'm sure that's probably the case anywhere, but I have particular beef with Texas, so it's fun <laughs> to think about you know, that relationship. Um, I like writing about Texas because I'm also from here and I've been a part of the community for a while and I know artists and I feel like it's really gratifying to see the way that we work. It's a super diverse place and um, I want to honor that diversity and that hard work by thinking about it, processing it, and sharing it. That's my goal when I write, it's just to share. I forgot what the other two questions were though. I kind of wanted to write And then I was just kind of asking about other venues for arts right into here. I know that's a multi-step question. You don't have to answer all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or do I? 
Maybe I feel more confident writing about art that's from a place where I've spent time because I understand the history and the context and the feeling better. But also it feels more motivating um, because I'm trying to shine a light on maybe something that doesn't get as much attention uh, right. in other ways. If possible, yeah. yeah. What do you think about it? Yeah. You've spent your time a lot of places, so yeah, but you've yeah. chosen to be here, so yeah. yeah. Um, my interests have always been in places and regions and the creative communities that have developed within them. So I've spent my life kind of moving around one part of the country to the next and then deep diving into particular communities as an advocate and as an organizer, essentially. Um, so as a curator, I've done a whole series of exhibitions on artists and art made in different parts of the country. And I would say in response to your question that I think I decided pretty early on that when it came to the catalog, and I sometimes was able to do them because I could get a foundation to cover it or whatever, um, I would ask a local writer to those communities to write about it because I really wanted the language of the place to be in service to the art that I had pulled together and my function only became what I think it always is which is somehow I've ended up being paid to go out and look around the world and find incredible things and bring it back and go hey everybody look and I didn't want to be the one that then laid my sense of perception even permanently into an essay. Much more interesting to have um, Amy Gersler, who's a poet in LA, or Catherine Hickson when she was alive, who was a critic in Chicago, write about the work from that place um, than to have me do it. Uh, yeah. But when I do write about art from here, um, Again, it's always in a, in a kind of collaboration with the artist, and um, I very much always try to use their language as well, you know, so that, so that there's a place for the maker to speak as well. One of the questions that was asked was, what would we like to see here? And that's the tough one, and that could have been the whole evening. Um, Lauren, can we start with you, since you've You've been kind of out there as an art writer. <laughs> um, you've just left, and so maybe that's your answer. But, but, yeah. but no, I didn't leave because of yeah, that. No, right. but what, gosh, it's such a hard question. It is and a I've hard already question. been yeah. so spicy uh, earlier, so I don't know if I should <laughs> keep going. Okay, Laura, Let's you just take like an assignment. That part. I spent uh, 25 years in New York City, and. I came back here during the pandemic. I have an elderly father I care for, but I have a, a BFA. And for me, it feels like a place that we can, we've been discounted, as, you know, in comparison to Houston. I grew up in Houston, born and raised. And we've been discounted, you know, against Houston, even San Antonio. And I think that Austin feels like I'm not going to use Wild West because I don't think Wild West, I think it's a place that we have the ability to make it something, and, I, and I'm going to sound like an idealistic moron, but I really believe this, is we have the ability to make something that we all want to see. I mean, you know, when I go to New York, I go to, you know, all the places and see the stuff and I will put anything here at Grey Duck and I have a stir and any of it against anything I see at Company and Karma and da 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 because there's a jadedness I feel like there and here there's a hunger I feel like and when I see I mean yeah sure we all eat tacos for breakfast and wear cowboy boots but there's a hunger here really that is just a real thing because we're like we're doing shit we are 
Very much so, mm -hmm. without question. A lot of performance work here, really. That, that's my heart, and I've seen some stuff that I'm like, wow, you know. So, yeah. How are we doing on time, Sona? We're going to spend like three hours doing this. I mean, it doesn't have to, doesn't have to be rigid. Oh, okay. Like, do I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, anybody else have something to add to talk about? We've, you know. Why are we, why is Austin considered the outback? I mean, what is that? Mm -hmm. I always wondered, like, what, what? I went. used in San Antonio? I went to this, there's a, the guy, he, I think for 10 years he was the head of the architecture department at UT and he has a house here and I went to go tour his house and the, he, the guy who is now the live-in curator was the longtime partner but what he was saying is that we were not a, an oil hub and so there was that time, I mean, uh, you know, let's get it a bit gross, but a lot of these people that created these hubs, Dallas, even, you know, even San Antonio, that definitely, the McNay brought to you by, you know, fossil fuel, but Austin wasn't that. And so we've been this kind of, you know, uh, university town or whatever, you know, place where, and so, but the university has, I mean, the work, and I think I was just saying to you, is the carver. Like, whoo, the carver. Y'all, people have been sleeping on the carver because that is, you know, I saw a good show that's up currently. But I think that people, there's just there, you know, in a in a flip side, there the lack of criticism has allowed people to just experiment and not worry about like, oh no. Who's going to say what? People are like, fuck it. I'm going to just, you know, make some crazy thing with spaghetti and call it a day, you know. And so <laughs> I don't just do that. That's, that's in the, like, the lily thing, the, the, the foam and the lily thing. But that's yeah. what I, you know. Can you tell me what the criticism you've heard is that it's subversive? I will not <laughs> put a name to that. But I have heard this term, and I'm not going to out the, the yeah. Per, yeah. yeah. But yes, I have heard. <laughs> but I had a quick question, um, and this kind of comes up from some of our pre-conversations, which was the art ancestors. Ah, yeah. Yeah, which I think is like really. Emily brought yeah, that. That was one of the, a big takeaway is you use that yeah. term and and I had mentioned to the rest of you, it's like, I, what, who are your artist ancestors? Or Yeah, yeah. Um, correct, correct my usage of that term if it's no, better. No, no, great. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, well, just to round out a thought I had about the, well, I would just feel remiss if I didn't say this about, it kind of relates to Jamie's question of like, what would I like to see? Um, but also just the larger conversation about like, why why is it like this here? <laughs> Which I feel like everyone is always asking about Austin. There's a lot of self-reflexive mm -hmm. questions about this place, which is interesting. Um, but I, I really just think that uh, for some reason, and I, I'm not gonna diagnose it, I have no idea really, but like there is just uh, a lack of funding, whether that means paying artists, paying art writers, paying art installers, paying the cap for what we believe art labor is worth is very low mm -hmm. in most places. It could almost never be high enough, but um, it's pretty low. And I think if you're relying, as many art spaces in town do, on city funding or having f generous friends who are wealthy, you are the, the structure that you are reliant upon dictates what kind of work, whether it's art or art criticism or performance, whatever, what kind of work you are incentivized to show. If you're getting s funded by the city, you, and a lot of y'all know way more about this than me because I don't have that, but if you're getting funded by the city, there's certain metrics you have to uh, provide to show that you are reaching certain goals, which are noble goals like diversity, things like that. But you know, it kind of, it's hard to measure some things. And so um, if you only have one source of 
really serious funding for a project, then um, you know it can it can really really practically shape what you're able to do. And um, I think just really earnestly putting a little bit of your money where your mouth is <laughs> would just like do so much for the art community here um, so that you are able to make work that doesn't say that doesn't have to prove what it what function it has or you're able to make writing that doesn't have to prove what function it has it doesn't have to say I just solved racism with the, my show <laughs> you can <laughs> Why? That show it? <laughs> you can just say I made <laughs> sculptures and that is worth it you know I made yeah, I made an true. installation and that is important and has always been important to cultures globally in all of history um, you don't have to quantify all the time so I think just um, what I really love to see is like that that art writing prize there's like a glass tire I think art writing yeah. prize someone yeah. correct me um, that's really cool it's like a generous but not totally obscene amount of money um, I don't know where it comes from, but I think that that is, you know, I do. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Someone does. So, you know, things like that are really encouraging, and it would be really cool to s I can't apply for that because I'm not in uh, grad school, but, uh, you know, things like that are really cool, and it would be really great if someone was like, yeah, this is the art prize in my name. This is the Emily Lee Art Prize where I give $20 to someone who, you know, whatever, I, whatever percentage of my income is correct, but... Um, yeah, this is where I give some recognition, acknowledgement to someone um, for the work that they did. Yeah, but all of a sudden, you're doing that with all of a sudden, though. Just, so, just be, you know, give yourself your flowers, my dear, because mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're, you're being the change that you want to see. So, you know, don't forget that. So. Well, art ancestors, I think, come into that, too, now to move there. But um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's nice to hear because it's yeah, it's a very vague and amorphous project. So, um, yeah, I think uh, we were talking about, um, you know, we are here in this place in time. We live in Texas. We live in Austin. Whatever. Um, but there are still people who uh, came before us who served to influence us as if they were alive today and served to influence me. So there's tons of people who, even though I am in my little bubble in space and time here. Um, plenty of people who I'm actively in conversation with as I write and as I make work um, who when I listen to an interview of theirs or when I read something by them or when I look at their work I feel like I have I feel like what they've made gives me permission to make what I want to make whether that's writing or art and there's an endless list that I totally like I emailed Laura a novel <laughs> I was like, I'm going to just do names, the whole annoying sure. thing. But it was like a bibliography of almost everyone who I consider my art ancestor. And it spans like Emily Dickinson or uh, That's Jane Bennett or um, Well, you had someone. Simone de Beauvoir, Ben Lerner, Anne Carson, Eileen Miles. Like, um, yeah, you had, those are some of the people that you. Yeah. Had, so, yeah. Yeah, just. Um, and I'm a really slow reader. I'm like pretty bad at reading. <laughs> I was very troubled by the task of reading for like mo one to 18 years old. So, but um, yeah, uh, they just, they serve to kind of um, uh, put some gumption into these thoughts I'm having in, in the studio and in writing. And I think like all of us probably have uh, alive and not alive versions of art ancestors um, that influence us. Um, there's like a couple in the room today you know um yeah well, i mean i love that yeah could yeah. i pick up on both something that emily okay. just said and also going back to jamie's question so you know what is it about this place that makes us the way we are and um one thing is that austin is changing all the time um the other cities have more kind of established monolithic economies reputations dialogues that run constantly throughout them. Austin's really amorphous. You know, you've got 50, 60,000 people a year coming in and then leaving in a few years. It's constantly changing. Um, that's a great thing, I think, you know, empirically speaking, that's a great thing. The other thing is that the arts ecosystem was a phrase that was mentioned, I, I, Sano, I think, in, in the beginning, in the introduction, acknowledging that's what we're all part of. Um, and ours has been 
always on the verge for as long as I've lived here and yeah. everybody else could say the same thing, right, Michael? It's just always on the verge. But we're getting there and we're getting there largely because of a number of people in this room. So in an arts ecosystem, old school, 20th century, I'm hoping it's changed. I'm not sure I'm the one that can define it now, but you needed art makers, art viewers, art collectors, art writers, art sellers, to hold the whole thing together. And if one of those legs of the stool wasn't there, it didn't necessarily come together so well. Those other cities have historically had all those pieces. We've never had collectors. We've only had a few writers, despite the wealth of intellectual talent. Robert couldn't do it all on his own. Robert and Jean Claire couldn't do everything. What they did was massive. Um, and so now what we have are artist-run spaces, Sean, Emily, others in the room. We've got gallerists in the room. More importantly, those people are hanging out with each other. That's what we have in this town. We have a fluidity across sector and across role. And that's going to be the key to our success, I believe. If we can get, and I'm on the board of the Contemporary Austin, and many of the board members are wealthy collectors, and my job on that board is to try to introduce them to as many people that I know in the art world so that their world isn't as insular as it might be. Um, if we all take whatever sector we're a part of and deliberately try to reach out, yay sano, to cross-current that, we will find these boats finally start to rise, I believe. And then we'll have the ace in the hole, which is that we're more fluid, we're more mutable, we can embrace change. We just haven't gotten there yet, and those of us that have been hearing, and it's about to happen for a long time, uh, just need to hold on longer. That's all. <laughs> And keep like, doing it, like you right? Say, this time is the time. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I. Like the people on the board, they one of them could be here. Right. And they would feel really cool. Yeah. You know? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's spring break week, and everybody's out of town. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the cool kids are here. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. How are you guys feeling? That was great. Actually. Yeah. Has anybody have anything? I saw a hand. Go. Oh, yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin. Just on this, on this topic of like, what does Austin need and where are we right now? Um, I've been in Austin for kind of a short amount of time, but uh, was able to work in a gallery that had existed in Austin for a long time and still does. Um, I think that this idea of like, we're on the verge of something, or we've always never been able to crack through is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that like we can look around this room and there's a lot of people in this room being very scrappy and doing amazing things. It's like we're here. We you know, we've done it. Like what else what else do you want? Um, like That's I think interesting. We, we need to like take stock and uh, be proud yeah. of what we've built and like build on it, but we're we're doing it. I think taking That's stock cool. is a really That's cool. know, important part of it. And, and you know, and Annette, you've done that. You were one of the first to write a book. I think it was like Years ago or 15 years ago? <laughs> 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, sister. Yeah. 86, but, I, mean, I own it. The whole it. thing of like calling it out, you know, like Jill always said jokes with, about, you know, we need like a, a copy book, you know, of the history. It needs to be written. The history of collab needs to be written. <laughs> you know, there needs to be a. I'm going to fucking cuss. There needs to, <laughs> there needs to be a book about this big. You know, there, it needs to be documented. <laughs> You know, so which is also part of the writing, but it's just, mm -hmm. it's it's chronicling, it's getting it down, getting it down. You know, there's a lot of DIY spaces here. There's, uh, I mean, one of the things I, I wrote sort of in my anger journal of all my friends who are, you know, working their ass off and getting burnt out. You know, uh, it's a hell of a lot of work. Who have day jobs? Who you know, work at the museum who, you know, have kids, and then they're also doing shed shows on top of that. You know, my, I think, was at one point was teaching in three different places, you know, and also trying to do their work. 
you know, and it's just, I'm like, come on, people, I mean, Jesus, you know, but there is this thing of, of, of documenting it and getting it down, like just every, as much as we can, you know, another reason why I love um, our talks, and Scott's not with us tonight, but, um, and I listened mm -hmm. to your interview, you know, and one of the things he said, I love it when I got, you know, like, I got listened to all these different interviews, and I met that person, and I already had an in, because I listened to the interview, mm -hmm. you know, what Scott was doing was really, really, really important, mm -hmm. where he was, he was putting it down, you know, and I just think the more we do that, it's really great, too. What about Robert? You've been here writing for so long. I mean, yeah. you got anything to say about something? Well, I was, I was actually thinking I would echo something Sona just said, which uh, has to do with the need of documentation. In the last year, I've been approached by a handful of People who are playwrights and theater artists, they're spread around the country now, but they were all in Austin and cut their teeth here in the late 90s. Um, and now that they have been away for a couple of decades, they collectively have looked back and said, there was something special about that city, there was something special about that time, there was something special about that community where we were all working and growing together and experimenting together. They came to me and said, we believe this needs to be documented, not only to tell our story, but because there is the opportunity to share with people today who may have never lived in that community, may have never had yeah. that group of artists to work with and grow with, and that we might present our time as an example for how artists today, uh, particularly younger artists, might say, this is a way we can grow and change, you can grow and change. I'm working with them, we're actively trying to do it. I have no idea if the book will ever actually happen, but what I would say is, Right now, there's a lot of commitment on the part of those artists, and they found this burnout old arts writer to come on board, and yeah. I will help them as long as I am able. The thing I would say is there's no time to waste. Yeah. I chronicled a lot of those stories uh, while they were happening and was very proud to do so. Uh, but I won't be here forever. Um, it may be that all those stories that are on the Chronicle website won't be on the Chronicle website forever if the Chronicle ever goes down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like if that story needs to be told, and I believe that it does, start working to find a writer or writers who will help to set that stuff down, chronicle it, document it, and make sure it's still out there. The great thing, I think, about Austin, the reason I loved writing about it for so long, is people don't tell you no here. <laughs> if you want to start a gallery, if you want to start an artist collective, if you want to turn big bunch of empty garages into <coughs> art studios, by God, nobody will stand in your way. It may be hard to do, and you may only be able to do it for a very short time, but people won't stand in your way. And I have seen so much great art come out of this city, so many great collaborations, so many wonderful collectives and spaces that I loved and that I mourned and that I'm excited to go to now. Um, and I think the key to this arts community, whether it's visual arts or performing arts or literary arts, is people talking, people being together, people sharing, people forming. So as long 
is that still happening? And as I look around this room, it's clearly still happening. Um, that's the way we sustain each other and continue to build. Well said. That's it. We've, we've talked about some fun stuff and we've, you know, yeah, we'll keep this going. But thank you. This is, look around, this is our community. So, you know, keep talking to all these people and thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming in from Spain. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys, really.